So I will um, just make a few remarks here to introduce our speakers. But first, I thought it would be interesting to discuss um, something some of you may already know, which is Pennypack Trust started off as a watershed association. Um, in the late 60s, we had, believe it or not, a lot of sewage, detergent, and contamination in the Pennypack Creek. And Feo Pitcairn and several concerned locals actually assembled to um, do something about it. They, they fondly remembered swimming in the creek, fishing, just growing up and enjoying it, and they wanted to do something about this contamination. So that led to the Pennypack Watershed Association being founded and officially established in 1970. Um, and we had David Whitwer, a, a prominent watershed planner, become our director. And with the Clean Water Act as well that followed, we really took great strides to restoring the watershed. Um, the creek itself is 22 miles long, but the watershed is 52, 56 square miles. And so that includes a lot of tributaries that feed into the creek. And um, many of you may have parts of the tributary in your backyard. So it really is all interconnected and our neighbors are all um, part of that watershed. So um, we are still in working to restore the degraded watershed and um, continue to do research to monitor the conditions over time. So with that, I will introduce our speakers tonight. Um, our first speaker is Peter Gunnis. He is a retired physician and he's been a penny pack stream keeper since 2016. He's really interested in the macroinvertebrate, using macroinvertebrates as indicators of stream health. And he's made great uh, presentations in the past, actually 2019. It was a really interesting talk he gave um, via Penny Pack. Next is Nick Maselko. Um, he was a Penn State Abington student and has been heavily involved in a lot of watershed associations here locally. Um, his skills in macroinvertebrate ID have been really invaluable uh, to this project and to others, and his photography is phenomenal. And finally, our intern here at Pennypack Trust, Rachel Zobel, she uh, focuses on research and restoration in the Pennypack main stem and its tributaries. She's currently earning her PhD from the University of Delaware in watershed hydrology and biogeochemistry. And her research focuses on the impacts and effectiveness of the restoration in watersheds. So thank you all for speaking with us tonight and I will turn it over to Peter. And I will stop sharing. Okay, so thank you. So uh, I was asked to kind of introduce the subject of macroinvertebrates in the watershed. And for those of you who might have heard me speak last year when I talked about my experience as a stream keeper, there will be a little bit of a review here. But this is basically explaining what the issues are that led us to want to look more carefully at the macroinvertebrates in the watershed. So the first question that we would kind of want to bring up here is, well, why are we even looking at macroinvertebrates at all? What's the interest of this? And one of the main importance here is that macroinvertebrates are important indicators of water quality. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey a few years ago did a multi-city study of chemical and biologic markers in urbanized streams. And what they found was that the most consistent correlate to urbanization was macroinvertebrate diversity. So the more urbanized the stream was, the fewer macroinvertebrate species that you saw. So in a stream like Pennypack, you can look at the stream and count the macroinvertebrates and get at least a feeling for how the urbanization of the area has affected the water quality of the stream. And then the second important issue is that their macroinvertebrates are an important part of the food chain. So this would kind of show a simplified version of a food chain in a stream like Pennypack Creek the primary producers of the algae and diatoms, and then the 
primary consumers would be macroinvertebrates like caddis, fly nymphs, mayfly nymphs, etc. And then these in turn provide food for fish and ultimately for birds which eat the fish. So if you want to have a healthy population of fish and birds in and around your stream, you have to have a healthy population of macroinvertebrates living there for them to live off of. So this is a kind of review slide of the kind of macroinvertebrates that you might find in a stream like Pennypack Creek. And it's classified by how tolerant these are to pollution. And I think another way of looking at this is how tolerant are they to urbanization. So the group one at the top are macroinvertebrates, most of which are the larval forms or nymphal forms of adult insects that lay their eggs in the water. And these guys are the ones that basically don't like pollution. So they're pretty much mostly found in clean, fresh water. In particular, the stoneflies, may, mayflies, and caddisflies are considered important indicators of clean, fresh water. So if you find a lot of species of these kind of larval forms, then you can be pretty confident that you have a healthy stream. And the second group are, in, are organisms like the damselfly nymphs that can tolerate some pollution but are not totally pollution tolerant. And then at the bottom, then you have things like midge larvae, black fly larvae, and worms, which can live in a lot of conditions. So they're pretty tolerant, and even in fairly polluted waters, you may find these. In a very healthy stream, you're going to find all these organisms. You're going to find mayflies and caddisflies and worms and blackflies all together. So diversity, lots of different species, is characteristic of a healthy stream. But once you start seeing urbanization and pollution, you start losing the organisms at the top. And eventually, in a very urbanized setting, you're just going to see these organisms at the bottom, the black flies, the midges, and, and the worms. Now, my interest in this started a few years ago when I started as a stream keeper and was looking under rocks, and I found this, which is a mayfly nymph. And everything that I'd read about Pennypack Creek said I shouldn't find mayfly nymphs here, it's too polluted. So I was surprised. And I showed it to our executive director, David Robertson, and he was surprised too. He didn't expect to see this either. And he was surprised because of this, which was a study that he had published in 1992, which was a study looking at aquatic organisms, macroinvertebrates particularly, in a variety of streams in the uh, Philadelphia area. And the part that's relevant to us was that when they looked at Pennypack Creek, what they found is that you may all know is that there is a um, water treatment plant just a short distance above the Pennypack Trust property. And below the water treatment plant, what they found was that there was very limited macroinvertebrate diversity. Within the property of the trust, they found midges and black fly larvae and worms. But within the trust property, there weren't any mayflies, there weren't any caddisflies. So clearly something was different back then than was occurring now. So it turns out, although this was published in 1992, he had actually collected the specimens in 1988. And at the time he was doing the collection, the water treatment plant, plant was in the process of uh, undergoing an upgrade. And in particular, they had expanded the capacity. Prior to that, they'd had problems with sewage overflow because the capacity was not keeping up with the urban spread. And also they'd added a nitrogen removal process. So since that time, we have to presume the water's become somewhat better. And when we look in the stream now, we find more organisms than he found. So just a quick run through, we do find some mayfly species. Uh, this is one, Stenochron interpunctatum, and we find caddis. Uh, this is a net spinning caddis, actually a finger net caddis, and a different species of caddis, a net spinning caddis. And we find damselfly nymphs, and occasional dragonfly nymphs and aquatic crustaceans. So when I first saw this, I thought, oh boy, wow, we must have a really clean creek because we got mayflies and we've got caddisflies. But that was actually an overestimate of the reality. This creek is not anywhere near as clean as that. And this is for two reasons. One is that even though we have some mayflies and caddisflies, there's actually very few species. And Nick will go into this in more detail. A healthy stream is going to have several species of mayfly and several species of caddisfly, whereas we only find a few. And the other is that not all mayflies and not all caddisflies are created equal. So although most mayflies and most caddisflies are pretty intolerant of pollution, a 
a few of them actually do tolerate pollution pretty well. And as it turns out, the ones that we are finding in the mainstream of the penny pack are the more tolerant ones. So although they are mayflies and caddis, they really belong down here in group two rather than the top group here. So what we can say is back in the middle part of the 20th century, Pennypack Creek was in this kind of bottom group that just had the very tolerant organisms. And presumably because of the upgrade to the water treatment plant and other efforts by the trust to improve the water quality, we've now kind of moved up a bit. But Pennypack Creek is still not a high quality water uh, body and does not have a large diversity of, of uh, intolerant organisms in the main stem. So obviously the question is raised, well, why is that? So one of the questions I'd asked last year was whether it was possible with extensive urban development, industrial development, et cetera, that all the sensitive species in the watershed had just been wiped out and they're just gone for good. And the other speakers in this uh, talk are going to address that. So I'm going to leave that to them. Uh, the other question was, how does Pennypack Creek differ from a healthy stream? And this, issue, this issue came up with another streamkeeper activity we had when Kevin Roth took us on a field trip to see the Stroud Water Research Center, which, as most of you know, is one of the premier water quality research centers in the country. And the Stroud Research Center is built by Pennypack Creek, which is, or I should say, by White Clay Creek, which is their research creek. And this is a very healthy stream. They've uh, if, um, you know, isolated hundreds of different species of macroinvertebrates from White Clay Creek. So when we were walking by the stream on our field trip, I mentioned to Kevin that if I looked at my site and I look at White Clay Creek, they don't look that different. This is a picture I grabbed from the internet of White Clay Creek, and you see it's got a good riparian buffer with trees. It's got a lot of cobbles. Macroinvertebrates love cobbles. It's got riffles and got clean looking water. And this is my site in the Pennypack Trust where I do my streamkeeper. It has a riparian buffer, thanks to the efforts of the trust to preserve the land. It has clean looking water, it has cobbles, and it has riffles also. So why does White Clay Creek have a ton of organisms and, and we don't? And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm not going to address, but I did uh, get put in touch with one of the educators at, White, at uh, Stroud Water Research who sent me a couple of things which I thought would be interesting to look at. So one addresses the issue of salt. So as we all know, road salt, we use to de-ice our roads here. This gets washed into the streams. It also persists in the soil and leaches into the stream. And although the lethal concentrations of salt from macroinvertebrates are pretty variable, we do have to assume that at least some organisms probably don't tolerate the high levels of salt. So Stroud has kept a continuous uh, monitor in White Clay Creek and also in Pennypack Creek. And this shows a comparison of what they measure for salt. So what they're measuring here is conductivity. The more salt in the water, the better the water conducts electricity. So the higher number here means more salt in the water. And on this graph, the blue line is White Clay Creek. And as you can see here, the levels of salt in White Clay Creek are pretty low and they pretty much don't change with the seasons. The orange is Pennypack Creek. And you can see here the levels of salt in Pennypack Creek are at least three times as high just in general than they are in White Clay Creek. And then in the winter times here, in the January, February measurements, you get these big spikes of salt, which happen when they salt the roads and then it rains or melts and washes into the streams. And obviously we have to be concerned that these high levels of salt may be inhibiting the growth or even killing some of the macroinvertebrates that otherwise might potentially live here. And the other thing I was curious about was water temperature. So water temperature in our streams in general reflects the ambient climate temperature. But in a healthy creek, which is out in the woods, water is going to fall on the forest floor, which is shady. It's going to percolate through cool soil into the stream, and you're going to have a cooler stream water. But in an urbanized area, a lot of the water, particularly in the summertime, is going to fall on asphalt, like roads and parking lots, which is superheated by the sun. And that hot water then comes through the sewer system into the stream and raises the water temperature. And higher water temperatures have some deleterious effects. So one is that oxygen dissolves better in cold water than it does in warm water. So when you have warm streams, they have less oxygen in them. And then the other is that the animals living in the stream 
if they're invertebrates, their metabolic rate is increased by the high water temperatures. So what happens is that their oxygen demand increases at the same time as the presence of oxygen is going down. So water temperature can limit what organisms can live in a stream. And I kind of tend to think of 20 degrees centigrade, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit as a cutoff between the cold water species and those that can tolerate warmer water. So this is a graph of water temperatures in White Clay Creek and Pennypack. In this case, the colors are reversed. So here, orange is White Clay Creek and Pennypack is the blue. And during the winter time, the temperatures are pretty much identical. But in the summertime, you can see that White Clay Creek maxes out its temperature at about 20 degrees centigrade. So it's still staying in that tolerance range for a lot of the cold water species. The Pennypack Creek goes several degrees higher during the warmer summer months. And again, this may be too warm for some of the sensitive species to survive in. So those are at least two reasons why we may have a difference between a good creek like white clay and a not so good creek like Pennypack. There's obviously other reasons like silt deposits and intense flooding and uh, loss of food and so forth. But uh, there's clearly a lot of reasons and all the reasons aren't well defined. So that's uh, my introduction to all this, and I'm going to now hand this over to Nick Maselko, who's going to talk about how, what we find when we look in the tributaries. Sorry, I muted myself there. Um, all right, so I'm Nick Maselko. Um, I'll be talking about the invertebrate data between the main creek and the tributaries of interest that we found, um, as well as some of the chemical data. So we took um, approximately 1,000 invertebrates throughout the Pennypack watershed, as shown on the map here, and some of the more interesting images are shown on the left. Um, starting with the invertebrate data, I'll be introducing this as if we were trying to qualify the streams for high, qual high water quality status. So I'll be going through taxa richness, modified EBT, Isenhoff, percent dominance, and modified mayflies. Starting with taxa richness, the main creek, we found approximately 47 invertebrates over 23 miles um, demonstrated here, whereas the tributaries had 23 additional invertebrates in under two miles, which shows that there's already more taxa in a smaller area plus the taxa from the main creek can still thrive on the tributary. And that was the first indicator, oh, excuse me, that the tributar tributaries were significantly different from the main creek. Uh, one of my favorite organisms that we found on the main creek is this fellow right here. So this is Amelitis. It is a mayfly that is highly sensitive and is a good intro into EPT, EPT standing for Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Tricap, Tricoptera, or our mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. As Peter mentioned, these would be our group one organisms. And also, as he mentioned, there aren't many on the main creek. So right here, we have two genus of mayfly on the May Creek, May creek on the main creek. We didn't find any stoneflies, and we found six different genus of caddisfly. Now, when we look at the tributaries and add that on top, the, the caddisflies more than double, the mayflies triple, and we suddenly have four different genus of stonefly in the Pennypack watershed, which is really exciting. Uh, again, there are, nine, there are nine images here in Ephemeroptera because there are actually two species of Amelitis, which is one genus. Both of these stenocron are also a genus, and there should be more genus of baited, but they were never keyed out, so that's just counting as one. So six should probably be a bit higher. Uh, his and Hoff values are a way to add a numerical value to the sensitivity of these organisms. When we look at the EPT found on the main creek, we generally see values between four and seven, which isn't great because with these values, it's like golf, you want the lowest values possible. Seracula is the exception being a three. When we look at the organisms we found on the tributaries, we suddenly see a lot of threes to zeros, which is very good. Not all the organisms found there fall in this category. There is Milana, for example, which is a six, but there's a significant number that are in that three to zero range that the, can really lower the score and show that the tributaries, again, are very different from what we're seeing on the main creek. 
which is really exciting stuff. Um, for percent dominance, um, this is the highest number of individuals divided by the total number. For the main creek, that would be Geronomidae year-round. These are, again, the lower, more pollution-tolerant organisms that um, we don't want to see dominant year-round. <laughs> for the tributaries, that may actually be a little bit different. Um, we're just going through our server sampling now, and hopefully what we'll see is EBT organisms becoming more dominant in these little tributaries. Finally, just to kind of go over everything in the modified may mayfly section. Again, the main creek, we have two genus of mayflies, which are both have both, both have very high his and hall values, whereas the tributaries have four um, more sensitive mayflies. Now the question is, why is this? Why is the main creek so diverse? Or <laughs> why is the tributary so diverse and the main creek isn't? Um, what I did is I took a water quality probe from the conservation district and studied, looked at the conductivity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH. And immediately, as Peter kind of mentioned with the road salt, conductivity was way different. Uh, the conductivity of the main creek was in that 600 to 800 micro semen range, whereas the conductivity of the tributaries and the Delaware River are in the 200 to 400 range, which is, they are significantly different sized bodies of waters compared to the main creek. Uh, you will see several drops in the data and that is due to rain events. Uh, you also may notice that the Delaware River is not here as I took that data from the USGS. Uh, the USGS also has a monitoring station on the penny pack now as well and also is indicating that the water quality is going into that 600-700 range which most invertebrates cannot tolerate. And as the, and mm, their station on the Trenton, on the Delaware in Trenton also indicates that the water, that the conductivity is in that 200 to 300 range. Uh, the rest of the data that was observed isn't as exciting as the conductivity. Um, for dissolved oxygen, the main creek was generally above 100%, the tributaries were generally below. Each one of these tributaries that are listed here do have stoneflies and other EPT organisms um, that kind of fill in the gaps and there wasn't anything real eye widening or exciting. Same goes with temperature. Um, one pattern that emerged, the main creek was always the warmest. The northernmost tributaries were always the coldest, but the other tributaries filled in the gaps in between that there wasn't a major difference. And same goes for pH, everything was within the six to eight range. The common pattern being the main creek always being the highest above seven, the tributaries generally being below, but no major differences. And that is it. So uh, I'm gonna pass this on. All right, so I will dive into the current research that we're doing and a little bit more detail of why we decided to do this. After the diligent work of the stream keepers, it was very apparent that we had a main stem versus tributaries issue. So that is exactly what we are looking at. And in this picture, um, what exactly do you see? You can feel free to comment in the chat box. Um, I can, I think I have access to that, but um, yes, I will look at that. So what exactly do you guys see in this dish? Or if you're outside in any other trust or land preserve or natural area that you're hiking, um, this, is, this is mainly what you do see. So you can find the sediments, the rocks, um, a lot of mud, but actually what's in there are these little guys. Um, and they are our macroinvertebrates. So on the left, we have our crayfish. Um, in the middle, we have a caddisfly species. And then to the right, we have a water penny with a little hitchhiker on him um, catching a free ride. So when you look into the streams or the main stem or when you turn over a rock, you can find these guys under all of that sediment throughout that mud. Um, they are there. 
So as we mentioned, we are taking a dive deeper into our main stem and our tributaries. So we decided to start with Karen Run, and this is Peter um, on the, our first day of sampling. And the arrow to the right is indicating the mouth of Karen Run where it feeds into the main stem. So we decided to sample the main stem and two different portions along Karen Run. Um, we used up top, the first picture, our server samplers, and what they are used for is you choose a random site within your sample location and anything within that one foot by one foot square of the server sampler, you will just disturb the area, scrub the rocks, and push all of the um, sediment, hopefully some macroinvertebrates, into, into the net. And you'll do that until you're pretty confident that you've scrubbed the rocks and everything um, within that benthic environment. And then the second picture is where our four buckets and you will take the macroinvertebrates and the samples that you have from that server sampler and you'll put them in to those buckets. Now the exact procedure that we did, we were lucky enough to have access to Stroud Water Center's research procedure. So what that calls for is you choose the site. So as I mentioned, we had three sites and within each site over 30 meters, you choose 16 samples. Now each sample goes into a random bucket out of these four. So at the end of the sampling, each bucket will have four samples each. And again, that's chosen at random. This is a quick time-lapse video of exactly what this process looks like. So we're putting the server sampler on the bottom, scrubbing everything on the floor, making sure we get all of that in the net. And then we bring it over to the bucket. I think the video got cut off so you really can't see the bucket, but that is essentially what the collection process looks like. And then we have our sieve. So we take our gallon, our five gallon buckets, we dump it into the sieve and we use a separator to then choose a quarter of the sample. Again, this is completely random um, to, you know, help best get our samples into the jars. And then we will have the jars, and again, each, um, each site has four different samples that we then take back to the lab and look under a microscope to sort through all of that sediment, the rocks and the mud, and make sure that we collect our macroinvertebrates. And then, as Nick mentioned, he, um, he was coming in and IDing these macroinvertebrates, so we have an idea of what exactly is living in our backyard. So if you're anything like me, graphs and tables are super intimidating, but I promise this is not as intimidating as it looks. So the, this graph and the ones to follow are just visuals to show you what exactly we are finding and how much. So we have some arthropods in there, isopods, we have different species. Um, of, we have our mayfly, our caddisfly. So this is the main stem to the mouth of Cairn Run. And the biotic index, or just the water quality rating, would be an average of 4.5. Now again, that is taken from the pollution tolerance that these macroinvertebrates can survive in. This is the confluence up Cairn Run. So as you can see already, we already have a jump in the, in the different diversity of macroinvertebrates that's available in the tributary versus the main stem. Um, this is where our crayfish came from. And again, we have the caddis fly in there. And the biotic index of the confluence is 4.19. And then we have Cathedral Road down Cairn Run. So again, increase in the diversity that's available already within the tributaries. We have some water pennies there, some damselflies. So, um, and then the biotic index is 3.94. And I'll talk a little bit about that within um, the next slide. 
So here is a chart showing the different biotic indices of the different sites. So Cathedral Road is clearly our healthiest um, tributary, and then the confluence is the next, and of course, as we can all assume, it would be the main stem. Now, a good water quality rating is five, um, but of course, as Nick mentioned, anything closer to zero would be best. So even though we are close to five as good, um, obviously, and of course, we want to continue to improve. So what exactly does all of this mean? Uh, Again, our tributaries are healthier and more diverse. Our ongoing restoration efforts matter. So if we look back all the way to 1970 and see how far we've come, it's really, really amazing. And it gives me, and I'm sure it probably gives all of you hope for the future of the trust as well. Um, you know, of course we can't do it alone. Um, legislation has really helped us, the Clean Water Act. And, and I'm really, really hopeful that we will continue to reach zero. The water quality is in the trust is good for the most part compared to what it used to be. But again, that doesn't mean that we stop now. That just means we keep powering forward. Some future studies that we will be doing at the trust is so we've only tackled Cairn Run. And if you're well seasoned within the trust, then you'll know there's so much more for us to identify and explore. So that's really where our future studies lie, is just gathering a better understanding and a more current understanding of what exactly is living out there. And then from there, we can kind of, you know, come up with some ideas as to how we can make the main stem and the tributaries even healthier than they already are. So with all that said, I would like to thank Pennypack, of course, for supporting us um, in doing this, TTF for lending us an extra server sampler. So sampling went from one site in three hours to two sites in three hours, which was awesome. Um, and then, of course, Stroud Water Research Center and all of you for coming tonight. All right. Thank you, Rachel. We're just going to have some closing remarks here. I will share my screen. Um, so as Rachel started to um, say, we have some next steps for watershed monitoring into the future. Uh, we'll be selecting several tributaries that we want to inspect for further macroinvertebrate diversity. And it's really exciting to see how a lot of the higher, um, the, the lower tolerance species are actually appearing in some of these tributaries. So we have a couple lined up to do some studies before winter is upon us. Uh, another project we're doing in our, some of our streams that are tributaries to the uh, creek, our uh, collaboration with Temple University with funding from the William Penn Foundation. We've installed loggers out at several tributaries to collect stream data. And of course, um, many of you are probably aware of our Stream Keepers volunteer program, where our volunteers go out um, on a frequent basis and they have their section of the creek that they can monitor and they really are watchdogs for any sort of issues that pop up and they become really experts in their section of the creek. So it's a great program and we love the volunteers there. I wanted to talk really quickly about our annual fund for Penny Pack Trust this year. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. We, our fund is empowering our conservation easement landowners. And some of you um, may know what a conservation easement is, but we have a lot of neighboring landowners around the trust that greatly value keeping the land wild for future generations. Um, they may have part of a tributary to the Pennypack Creek flowing through their property or a patch of forest that they enjoy bird watching. So they've entered into an agreement with the trust to make a parcel of their land a conservation easement, meaning it can never be developed and it's a safe haven for wildlife. Um, but 
even though they, these landowners may be removing invasives to try to encourage native regeneration or, and they're passionate about restoring that land, some of them have really challenging properties, like they may have really steep slopes or some extreme weather events will knock down their native trees and the invasives really quickly take over. So we're launching an initiative here at the Trust to try to support them to become conservationists um, and protect their piece of wildlife habitat. Um, so we will be um, launching an initiative to help remove invasive species and replace these with native trees. And it's very relevant to our research here um, in the tributaries and in Pennypack Creek because many of these properties have a tributary on them that are maybe not doing so well. We need to stabilize those stream banks and improve the water quality. And that would, it's very in interconnected, all these properties. Once the tributaries are stabilized and, and healthier, then we can see um, better water quality in the creek and, and in the surrounding watershed. So we really appreciate um, your contributions to this fund. We'll be sending out mailings um, and we're just hoping to um, stabilize these stream banks, really restore these easements. And then um, after we've uh, established these programs in each of the properties, these landowners will be able to continue sustaining their, their planted trees and their stabilized uh, stream banks. So really um, look out for that and thank you for your support. Um, with that, I will see if any of you have any questions. We have our chat box open, so feel free to start asking questions. Hey, this is Chris Mendel. Hello, Chris. Hey there, I see a bunch of questions in the chat window if you wanna start addressing those. All right, so we have a question from Claire. Can we assume there are no CSOs upstream of PERT in the watershed? Um, I'm not aware of Sorry, someone just answered. I'm not aware of what a CSO is. Could you explain that, Claire? Hey, this is Chris again. Yes. Uh, a CSO is a combined sewer overflow. And oh. it is a, um, it's where a sanitary, sanitary drainage and stormwater drainage are combined in the same pipes and uh, in traditional design, and I'm, I'm going back over, well, actually I'm, I'm not going back that far, believe it or not. Um, the, the base flow, if you will, within a CSO is designed to handle the sanitary flow and then that goes to um, a, a joint sewer authority or a sewer authority. And then the storm flow simply overrides that. And so the pipes and the connective passageways are designed with that in mind. Um, I, can, I, I can't say with authority that every single township doesn't have a CSO upstream from us, but I know that fecal coroform counts have decreased substantially since the Upper Moreland Hatboro Joint Sewer Authority have been essentially uh, being responsible for their Clean Water Act obligations. And you can see fecal coliform counts, excuse me, um, in their monthly reports. And if you don't have them, you can always contact me at the Pennypack Trust and I can forward them to you. Or you can get in touch with the Upper Moreland Hatboro Joint Sewer Authority to get that data. So all I can say conclusive, well, not conclusively, but speculatively, is that these townships upstream of us were not designed with CSOs 
in fact, most of them, including my house, have a, uh, a septic system. And then as neighborhoods were conjoined after the war, uh, they generally ran to a dedicated sanitary system. Uh, so I'll admit I'm speculating here. I don't know conclusively, but um, I, I, CSOs, as far as I know, are a, an urban condition from cities uh, that date back a, a good long time and with very high density. Sorry, that's a really long answer. No, thank you, Chris, for your explanation. Uh, looks like Deborah was asking about the stream data loggers. Um, basically, they look like um, they're more or less the size of a big glue stick, and they're but they're like black and they're pretty condensed. Um, they have sensors within them that are, can detect things. You'll place them within a water body and they'll, they can detect things like water temperature, velocity of the flow, um, some of them can do like uh, percolation, um, conductivity, so they, they have specialized sensors um, built into them to collect that data and then we um, download it on a monthly basis and, and we can make it available on a database. Let's see, maybe this, maybe Nick or um, Peter could answer this. How does Pennypack and tributaries macroinvertebrate diversity compare with Wissahickon and its tributaries? Sounds like they have a similar history. Uh, yeah, I think I can take this away. I'm sure the invertebrates on the main creek of the Wissahickon would probably be the same as the Pennypack. I personally have not sampled there yet, but I believe the conductivity on the Wissahickon is equally as high as it is over in the Pennypack. Though there could be tributaries hidden as well as there were here, so it's not impossible that there are little pockets of EBT or group one organisms that can still be found. So exciting stuff. Hope that answered your question. Is Rachel on the call? I am. I hey. Yeah, I was actually going to talk about um, my my sampling there, if, that, if that's okay. Please Go do. For it. Okay. Um, yeah. So about a year or two ago, I actually sampled, not officially or anything. I don't even think anyone knew that I was doing it. I was just doing it for my master's thesis, and I was interested in the Wissahickon because it does. You can research and, and sample in a very suburban area and then see how the diversity changes as you get downstream and closer to Philadelphia. So I found, and I did not do the same procedure, but I will say that I did not find nearly as much diversity in the Wissahickon as I did Pennypack. So which is great for us, but yeah, I, I did not, I actually had to go out and sample again because the first time I went out, I did not get enough at all to even be considered substantial for a master's thesis. So, and I also focused on microplastics as well. So when I collected the macroinvertebrates, I decided to look at the species diversity and then take them back to the lab and do some laboratory work there and see if they had ingested any microplastics. And I found that in every single site, there were microplastics present. So I did five different sites along the Wissahickon, again, upstream all the way downstream. So um, yeah, totally unofficial and didn't use the same procedure, but definitely worth noting. Thank you, Rachel. We had a question here about whether the penny pack is still considered impaired. Um, yes, it is. Several years ago, the EPA did a study on the water quality and found that there, it is still classified to be impaired. Um, a lot of it is like stormwater drainage and, and some of it can be seasonal, but it is still considered impaired. 
Um, we have a question from Claire about the salt impacts. Do we think they're all from road salt or are there other salt sources related to wastewater treatment or chemicals breaking down? That's a really good question. Um, I might try to answer that a little bit only from some reading that I did. So yeah. we would we'd have to assume that most of it is from road salt, but there can be other sources. In that US Geological Survey study that I was talking about where they looked at multiple cities, while it was true in general that cities that were in northern climates and salted their roads more had more salt, there was one city, and I think it was Atlanta, that the stream that they looked at in Atlanta, which doesn't have a lot of road salting compared to say Boston, another one of the cities still had one of the very high salt levels. Salt can just come from the environment in general. Some places are saltier than others, but there probably are other, you know, kind of commercial industrial sources of salt. And it really just depends on where you live. But I would have to guess around here because you can see the spikes of salt in the creek in winter that correspond to when the roads are being salted that the salting of the roads around here is still the main reason. Thank you, Peter. I just saw a question, is fecal coliform tested on the penny pack and its main tributaries? We do not test for that as far as I know, but I do know of other universities um, like around Philadelphia that have done tests um, and found um, the presence of E. coli closer to Philadelphia, um, but we don't test for that. Fecal, uh, this is Chris Mendel, uh, fecal coliform is tested by Upper Moreland Hapro mm -hmm. Joint Sewer Authority on a monthly basis. Um, and I, I, I don't know exactly what their testing methodologies are, but I know that those coliform counts are are listed in their test results. Similarly, their salt uh, loads are also listed in their test results. And I have asked them about whether or not those salts, is that salt coming in from sewage and then heading out? Um, or is it from other kind of environmental sources? And I've not gotten a, a, an answer from them. It, <laughs> I'm not really sure whether or not they're, well, all I can, all I can say is that the sewer authority uh, probably needs to be pressed a little bit more as to um, why that answer, why that question can't be answered because it really is important to our, tr to, uh, to Pennypack in particular. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the last question I saw was uh, a very good closing one, if there are no other questions. What can we members do to help improve the quality of the watershed conditions? Um, I mentioned our, our annual fund. We are Part of that is we're trying to stabilize the tributaries and improve the watershed. Um, so your contributions are greatly appreciated towards that. Um, we do have our Stream Keeper volunteer program um, that we may have openings for in the future. Um, I would say there are a lot of watershed associations in this area that are always taking citizen science, citizens um, scientists. They're having days to help them um, pl to plant trees, to clear invasives, all sorts of stewardship projects you can get involved in, not just with Pennypack Trust, but in a lot of other or organizations that you can help improve those conditions. Does anyone else have something else to add to that? Well, I might add a little bit to that. You know, one of the things that we've learned from all this was, you know, if you remember a year ago when I gave my talk, I asked the question, you know, did industrial and urban development just wipe out all the species here? And what Nick showed us is, no, it didn't. The kind of, you know, biological diversity that we're seeing here is not in the mainstream, but all these little tributaries are harboring a lot of 
biologic diversity that we didn't really know was there. So efforts to try to make sure that those areas where the tributaries are coming out of into the mainstream are, you know, preserved and not developed, you know, for the benefit of the future, you know, is an important thing. And obviously the annual fund to try to help those generous landowners who are already on board with that program, you know, is an important thing. Peter, I could not have said that better myself. Thank you so much. Um, one, one other note that Kevin Roth had brought up over a year ago is that we noticed on a, a freak Halloween era or Halloween uh, related um, snowstorm that s salt spikes had occurred in the penny pack on our sensors. And yet none of the upper watershed uh, township trucks were fitted to deal with the freak storm event. And so all of that salt was coming from uh, individual homeowners and from probably retail organizations like your local giant or Weiss or what have you. And so the, the power to reduce salt loads and sediment loads and temperature, i.e. placing trees over your impervious surface, over your rooftops, over your driveways, all of that can be done in a period of just a few years and a couple hundred bucks. And those make significant differences in how habitable those tributaries are, just as Peter said. So uh, the kinds of steps you can take on your own driveway and your own rooftop really, truly matter. And if you think ice and slippage are going to be a problem, put some elbow grease into it or simply stay home and get on yet another god-awful Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's a good point, um, Peter and Chris. Thank you for that. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, Kevin has provided us with his email, and you can certainly email us at our, our contact email address, contact at pennypacktrust.org if you have any questions. But otherwise, we'll close for the night, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>